Hello everyone, welcome back to the Red Team Training Series. In this video, we are going to be taking a look at hiding Linux processes. Now this particular technique is going to fall under defense evasion. And of course, this this course or this series isn't designed for uh, or wasn't designed with Linux in mind. But again, this is one of the techniques that's really, really important uh, because you will come across Linux systems. And uh, after you've in, uh, essentially established an initial foothold on the target system, uh, the one thing that you need to be aware of is the fact that uh, whatever processes you run or whatever uh, vector you utilize for initial access uh, will be visible to any administrators on the system. And again, you have to be very tactful in regards to what you're running. Uh, now, again, uh, as I've mentioned before, when dealing with Windows, uh, you know, there are a lot of steps involved uh, when you're dealing with the Windows environment, uh, you know, from initial access to persistence to uh, evading defenses uh, or any type of, uh, you know, defense system, uh, regardless of whether it may be an antivirus a solution or an intrusion detection system. When you're dealing with Linux systems, uh, you're primarily going to have a much simpler experience than you'd, you would have had with Windows. And one of the key techniques uh, that falls under defense evasion for Linux is the process of um, hiding Linux processes so that administrators or security analysts uh, can't actually identify any uh, anomalies within the process tree. Um, right, so in regards to what we will be covering in this video specifically, we'll take a look at how to hide Linux processes with lib process hider. All right, so uh, again, I'm just going to go through defense evasion uh, and the definition of defense evasion. So, and this is from the MITRE website. So, defense evasion consists of techniques that adversaries use to avoid detection throughout their compromise. The techniques used for defense evasion include uninstalling or disabling security software or obfuscating and encrypting data and scripts. Adversaries also leverage and abuse trusted processes to hide and masquerade their malware other tactics uh, other tactics uh, techniques are cross listed here etc etc right so we are going to be focusing primarily on uh, hiding and masquerading our processes or the actions that we perform on the target system and in this particular case uh, we are going to be, uh, we the, our scenario is fairly simple uh, the scenario is that we have just exploited or gained access to a linux server that's uh, being used by the company to host a web application and uh, we have got root access so uh, again our job now is to hide our process uh, to establish some uh, form of a backdoor and then uh, hide that particular process when it is running and whenever it is executed so uh, with that being said let's take a look at the practical aspect Aspect of this video now. All right, so I'm back on my Kali VM and I've logged into the target system. You can see it's a root at Red Team Linux, and I'm just going to display the information, the operating system information. But uh, let, let's start off with the distribution version. You can see it's Ubuntu. 20.04 and uh, if we enumerate the kernel information we can see that um, it's running version 5.4.73 and of course this is running on LXC uh, but again we know that it's running Ubuntu we know the kernel version we've obtained root access uh, however uh, again if we list out our process tree uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, quite a few processes, but we have Apache running. As I said, uh, this particular web server is being utilized uh, for to actually host a, um, a web application for the company. Uh, and you can see we have our connection here that we are actually utilizing. So uh, this uh, this current session is being facilitated through SSH. However, as you know, that is a big security, uh, a big security flaw, primarily because, uh, again, if an analyst or the administrator opens up the process tree here, uh, they'll actually be able to identify that, uh, hey, there's someone on SSH and they're using the root user. That's a bit of an anomaly, right? Now, of course, we can use libprocesshider to essentially hide uh, SSH connections. But again, that will be uh, an issue or it may raise a few flags because, again, administrators will go through the process tree and identify uh, or actually pick up that the SSH service isn't being or the SSH connection isn't being picked up in the process tree. Um, so that's where lib process hider comes into play. So again, the GitHub repository uh, or this GitHub repository will be linked in the description section. So you can actually check it out for yourself. And it is fairly simple. It is fairly simple in regards to how it works. 
and uh, again you can see it uh, essentially allows you to hide a process on the linux using the ld preloader and uh, you can see that the github repository contains um, a process hider.c script which we actually need to compile uh, with gcc so again you need to have gcc on the target system uh, and again it then provides you with instructions as to how you can go uh, ahead and load um, the global dynamic linker or load lib process hider with the global dynamic linker. Uh, now, I just want to explain a few things about how this works. But before we do that, I'm just going to clone the repository onto the target. And um, we're going to do this within the temp directory. So TMP, just so that we don't save anything where it doesn't belong. And we're just going to say git, uh, git clone. And we're going to paste it in there all right so there we are it's pasted and we can open up the repository and we have a few files uh, disregard the evil script python uh, script again this is used to actually demonstrate how this particular um, how this particular tool or utility works and uh, again we need to follow out the instructions for compilation so uh, again let me open up the github repository um, so these are the commands here we need to make and then uh, GCC, and uh, these are the co uh, compilation instructions here. So it's fairly simple. So again, we can say make, and uh, it's going to run the, um, the GCC compilation instructions. And now if we list out the contents of this directory, you can now see we have the shared object libprocesshider.so. However, we have, uh, of course, compiled it without actually analyzing the C file. So I just wanted to, uh, again, take you through the compilation process first. Uh, but let's re remove the shared object because that already contains the, co the compiled code. Now, this, is, this tool is on a per use case basis or on a per tool use case basis in that uh, you can only hide one process uh, or you can only add one process at a time or each uh, or this particular shared uh, shared object can only be used to hide one particular process uh, that uh, again we can configure uh, based on specific parameters of the tool that we are trying to utilize so for example again as i mentioned in the beginning of this video that ssh is really not uh, the uh, the best option when it comes down to uh, getting access to a target system for various reasons of course on linux and uh, we have to uh, find a way of actually masquerading our access to the target system so what we're going to do is I'm going to create a Python script that will actually provide us with a reverse shell that we can utilize. Um, so again, I'm just going to open up a Vim here and I'll call it shell.py, uh, right, or py. And I have the, uh, the reverse shell code here. So it's a Python 3 script. And of course, you require that uh, whenever, uh, you, if you're going to be creating uh, Python 3 scripts, the target needs to have Python 3. Alternatively, you can also use uh, C code. So I'm just going to copy this and you can see it contains um, the actual uh, Kali uh, IP address here and the port to connect to. Now you can also do the same uh, with Empire uh, and on your C2 server, you can actually uh, provide your C2 server uh, uh, your your actual C2 server details in regards to the listener. So for example, if it was a HTTP listener, we could uh, change the code here and again, provide the, uh, the address and the port to connect back to. But in this case, we're just going to be utilizing Netcat and that's going to keep things much simpler. Um, so I'm just going to copy that code and I'm just going to paste it in here, right? And what this code does is fairly simple. It essentially uh, uh, connects to the uh, the IP here, the remote IP, and uh, the port. Uh, and of course, this uh, this particular this particular system should actually be listening for a connection. And uh, once it re it receives uh, a connection, it's going to run the following command. In this case, it's going to run a it's going to run bash, right? So we should get a bash session with the user or with the user privileges that this script is actually run by. So we can save this. Right. And uh, let's just take a look at how this works. Right. So uh, I'm just going to open up a new terminal on my Kali VM here and I'm going to say netcat nvlp1234. And uh, now if I execute this particular shell script, so I say uh, again, let me just provide it with executable permissions. So chmod plus x shell.py and I say um, shell.py and I hit enter. You can now see on the target we get access via a um, via a reverse connection or a reverse shell and again we can pretty much do whatever we were doing 
Uh, however, again, let me just uh, terminate this connection and I'm just going to open up Tmux here just to show you what this looks like. Um, so I'll open up another session here. And again, this is on the target. So I'll go back into um, my first tab here or tab zero. And I'm just going to launch that particular um, script again. So I'm going to say shell.py. And uh, you can see it's saying connection refused. So I'm just going to set up my listener here. And I'll launch it again. And uh, you can see that it connects back. So if I go back into my first tab and I use a, a, a tool like PS or uh, again, that'll just display the, the process tree and I uh, display all the processes, you can see that this process again is also being captured within the process tree. And uh, this is the process that we want to hide. All right. So what that means is once we get our reverse shell, uh, we can exit out of SSH and uh, we can then, of course, uh, utilize this particular shell here for our access. However, we also need to be sure that this uh, reverse shell is hidden from the process tree so that uh, an administrator or a security um, or, or anyone responsible for security on the target system will not be able to identify this particular process. Right. And that's where the lib process hider uh, tool comes into play. So uh, what I'll do is I'll head back into um, this particular tab here. Let me just terminate the reverse shell. And there we are, that's terminated. And uh, let's take a look at libprocesshider now. So let, let me explain exactly what's happening here. Now, when you just clone the repository, you'll have the C code for the libprocesshider or processhider. And uh, this is essentially C code for a shared object right now. A shared object is similar to a DLL on Windows systems. They're again uh, called by particular programs uh, or scripts or utilities. Uh, so, for example, uh, if I use the case of a DLL, uh, Windows uh, DLLs are utilized to extend functionality of programs. So, for example, if someone wants to if someone is developing a program on Windows, and uh, they want to interact with the kernel or the network stack, they can call upon pre-built Windows APIs that will allow their program to do that. So they don't have to write that again, or they don't have to write code to do that. And uh, again, as we've already seen in the past, we can utilize or we can uh, exploit certain DLLs that Windows programs call and make the program execute particular code when that program is executed. In this case, what we're doing is uh, fairly similar. However, uh, again, we're utilizing or creating a, um, a shared object called a process hider uh, or lib process hider, if you will. And uh, again, let me just open up the code here. So lib process hider um, for some reason, it's not actually there we are, I'll just say vim process hider. And there we go. So we can see that uh, right here, provided as uh, in the form of a comment, uh, we can see that every process with this name will be excluded. So we need to provide a particular name that uh, again, this particular shared object will actually exclude from the process tree. Right and now, uh, again, in this particular case, we are going to need to customize this to reflect our particular Python script. And it could be any utility. You can block any utility uh, with this particular shared object. So uh, again, I'm just going to modify this to shell.py because that is what we're going to be using as sort of our backdoor into the system. So we are going to say shell dot py and what this does is it's going to filter out this particular process or any occurrences of a process with shell dot py in its name or uh, provided within the command arguments so again i'm just going to save and uh, now we can compile this um, so again what's happening here is we're essentially exploiting or leveraging the preloading functionality on linux all right, so the preloading functionality on Linux essentially allows us to load a custom shared library um, before the, uh, the other normal system libraries are loaded. This essentially means that if a custom library exports a function with the same signature of one of the one found in the system library, we are literally able to override it with the custom code in our library and all the processes will automatically pick our custom one. So that's essentially what's happening here. And this code isn't malicious in the sense that it doesn't interact or interfere with any of the other programs. All it's doing is filtering out the uh, that particular name that we provided uh, within the C code. So now that we have an understanding of what that does, we can actually go ahead and compile it. So we're just going to say make 
and uh, we'll hit enter and it's going to run the compilation um it's going to run it's going to compile the uh, the shared object uh, with gcc with the various flags provided here and again if we list it out now you can see we have the lib uh, process so or shared object so what we need to do now is if we take a look at the github repository we need to um, essentially amend or sorry append the uh, the following uh, lib process hider.so shared object into the etsy ld dot uh, so preload file uh, but before we do that we have to actually move the shared object into the user local libraries directory which is where we store libraries on linux so again we we can just copy it so i'm going to say uh, copy lib process hider dot uh, so uh, into user let me make sure that that is correct user local library all right so local and library and that's going to copy it there so now if we list the contents of uh, user local library um, you can see that it's going to add it in here now that that is done we now need to again echo that into etsy ld.so preload all right so again we can just uh, copy this particular command because it's pretty much the same in our environment and we do that now if we cat the content of uh, the ld.so.preload file uh, which is used for preloading uh, shared libraries um, sorry pre uh, load and uh, we're just going to hit enter you can see that that particular shared object is going to be loaded all right so before any other shared library and again what that does is it'll ensure that our that particular uh, process is filtered any uh, the, the any, any process that um, contains uh, the following uh, word or name shell.py is going to be filtered so we can actually verify that this has worked uh, by going back into our temp directory or the root of the temp directory and then executing the shell.python uh, script and again i'll set up the listener here with netcat and uh, you can see now i'm just going to run it so shell.py we hit enter and uh, let me just verify that we do have a connection there we are so um, ls aops we can see that we're currently within the temp directory and uh, now if we head over into our first tab here and i'm just going to clear that out and i say psaux uh, you can see that the the, the shell.python script process is going to be hidden here so again let me just uh, uh, scroll up and uh, you can see in the previous uh, process tree we had shell.py there and in in this case now we don't have any um we don't have any shell.py within the process tree or we don't have any execution of that particular script so that is hidden fairly well and uh, yeah that's essentially how to use the lib process hider utility to hide a particular process now of course this is um again going to be useful in cases uh where you want to hide certain processes that uh, could uh, could actually deal with data exfiltration or um or processes that could be cpu intensive and you want to hide those processes from the process tree uh, again we can also confirm this with the utility like htop just to make sure that we don't have it here and indeed we can see we don't have any occurrences of uh, shell.py here or the process for the reverse shell so what we can do now is uh, we can actually just uh, exit from here all right, so I've just um, got to terminate that and uh, let me just clear my screen here. And yep, that's uh, pretty much all that I wanted to highlight in this video. Again, uh, as we saw within the process tree, there may be a few, uh, few processes that um, essentially call upon the Python 3 binary. And again, what you can do for in that case, if you're using Python, is you can actually modify the C code. Um, so again, if I say um, process hider, dot c i can actually change this from shell.py uh, to any occurrences of python being executed uh, for example um, i can say here user uh, bin python 3 although uh, again as i said that may not be the safest thing to do given that uh, users on the system may also be executing scripts that utilize python uh, python 3 um, so again you can modify it based on your requirements and uh, again uh, you, you can then compile it and uh, again follow the same process that we did earlier. That being said, uh, that's going to be it for this video and I'll be seeing you in the next video.